all. This is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So this was an urgent matter that I wanted to discuss. And we have been discussing this amongst us for some, some days. And we are all aware of it. This is the acute hepatitis. Mostly mysterious or the cause of hepatitis is not really very well understood. And this is happening in children. Now it is in UK, US, Israel, I believe uh, some more countries as well. And some children have uh, died as well. Some children needed the liver transplant. So it is, it is an emergent situation. It's a serious situation. And there is a very interesting hypothesis by researchers from Imperial College and Cedar Sinai, which is Los Angeles, about six hours from where I am. And I thought that was a very important research to look at. So let's look at this research together. So I'm going to share my screen. This is drbean.com. If you, there is a link in the description for the most affordable ever price for drbean.com. So check that link out and you'll be surprised with the price. There's a one-time payment and you would have access to 800 to 1,000. Peter Broden and Moshe Arditi. Peter Broden is from the Department of Immunology and Inflammation, Imperial College London, UK, and Moshe is Department of Pediatrics Division of Infectious Disease and Immunology, Cedar Sinai Medical Center, Los Angeles. Now, this is these are very, very important um, topics. Uh, in addition to this, I wanted to show you this as well. This is Cedar Sinai's research, same hospital from where, or, or center from where Moshe is, and if I am hoping I'm pronouncing the name correctly. So here is a computer model shows how COVID-19 could lead to runaway inflammation. In this diagram here, this part is the spike protein. And this uh, orange and yellow and uh, this bluish area is the T cell receptor. We'll discuss that in a second. And this is acting, this binding is acting as a super antigen binding, which in turn can cause cytokine storm and severe outcomes or severe immune responsive state. So keep this in mind and let's look at the diagrams that I made for this one. So these are our uh, gifts for humanity, gifts for humanity. So here is this summary. I'll present this whole discussion in two uh, sections, summary and then the details. Summary is this. These children, majority of them, actually all of them, did not have any hepatitis A, B, C, D, or E virus in them. They have jaundice, then they develop hepatitis. Some of them end up in the hospital. A lot of them recover fine, but some have a need for liver transplant. Some die as well. None of them have hepatitis A, B, C, D, E virus in them. So it is not hepatitis virus that is causing it. So then what is this? So hear out the theory from these two doctors or these two researchers. What they're saying is that it is known from other studies that SARS-CoV-2 can make reservoirs inside the GIT of the children. I'm sure that it can do that in adults as well, but their study from Sida Sinai is about the children, so I'm just going to use that. So it can make reservoirs in the gut or the GIT, or the gastrointestinal tract, or the intestine of the children. Number one. Number two point. The SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, as I just showed you as well, this can act as a super antigen. In our uh, immune system's language, antigens that are super antigen, these can excessively activate the immune system, especially the T cells, and kind of make them go mad with activity and they become hyper-responsive and they start secreting lots of immuno-inflammatory um, uh, molecules and they become active. And it is suspected that the spike protein being super antigen is what is behind the cytokine storm as well, which kills people or causes intense disease. So now two things in mind. One, SARS-CoV-2 is sitting in the GIT making a reservoir. Two, the spike protein is so toxic that it can cause the uh, immune hyper-responsiveness. And if you see here, here is the immune system. And what happens is the T cells 
of the immune system, they become overly and broadly responsive. Broadly means they are not just the immune, the T cells not only responding to the spike protein itself, but they would now respond to everything else that comes in their way and res respond with hyper responsive or overreaction. So immune system is in this overdrive mode. Then what happens is, in this child whose immune system is in overdrive, in this child the adenovirus arrives. Now this adenovirus, which for example in the UK and England, the variant that they found for the adenovirus was 41F1 or 41F2. This adenovirus variant is actually a benign kind of a variant. It's kind of an inert variant. It doesn't cause too much of a damage in people when it arrives in there, except those who are immunocompromised or very, very young children whose immune system is yet not fully developed. Otherwise, it normally doesn't do much. So now this child whose immune system may have been in overdriven state because of SARS-CoV-2's presence and this the spike protein's presence. In that child, when this adenovirus arrives, then their immune system that is already in over-responsive state starts reacting badly or severely or intensely. Now, you could say that a cytokine storm could occur, but adenovirus itself doesn't cause the cytokine storm. And the immune system that is now in overdrive because of SARS-CoV-2, that is also not causing the cytokine storm. But important thing is that these activated T cells will become T help, will take T helper one pathway, that is their hypothesis, and I'll explain that in detail. I'm still at the summary. They would take T helper 1 pathway and T helper 1 pathway creates a lot of interferon gamma. Interferon gamma is known to kill hepatocytes in in vitro studies. Interferon gamma is known to cause immune system to overreact in mice with SARS-CoV-2. So in, in mice, it has shown to cause the overreaction of the immune system with the uh, of the immune system to the SARS-CoV-2, and in vitro studies, interferon gamma has been shown to be hepatotoxic or hepatocyte. It causes hepatocyte apoptosis. Apoptosis is the death of the cell. So now imagine the whole situation. There is SARS-CoV-2 clusters in the gut reservoirs. They are making spike proteins. Spike proteins are causing immune system to be overreactive. This overreactive immune system then finds adenovirus in the gut as well. This adenovirus is specifically going to attach to the gut because it has a trophism for the gut. That is, it likes to live in the gut and get the nutrition from there. And when it is trying to live there without really causing any damage, immune system is overreactive. Immune system starts producing lots of interferon gamma. That interferon gamma goes into the circulation, goes to the liver and starts killing liver cells. That would cause jaundice and mostly patients would recover. But in some cases, the liver failure can occur. And unfortunately, in some patients, uh, if not managed in time or, or if they had gone beyond the management, they had gone in fulminant state, then the death occurs. Now, fine, we understand this is scary and um, the question is, what do we do? So one little comment here, the UK patients of hepatitis, these children, 72% had this adenovirus in them. And I would present a little later how many of them had SARS-CoV-2. Now, researchers suggest that how do we confirm if their hypothesis is correct? And if so, what is the benefit of knowing this? So number one, they say that if a child is developing jaundice, start looking at their stools, do their stool samples for SARS-CoV-2 to make sure that they do not have SARS-CoV-2 reservoirs in their gut. That is one. Secondly, they say, look at their labs for interferon gamma. 
make sure that their interferon gamma is not in overdrive. And thirdly, if possible, T cell receptor skewing, meaning will the T cell take the immune system route towards T helper one instead of T helper two? These three are the suggestions that they make for labs. And then they say that if there is evidence that these are showing that there may be SARS-CoV-2 and the spike protein and the immune over-responsiveness, then immune, immunomodulation will be needed. So that is their suggestion. Now I'm going to go in the detail of the mechanism. So if you just wanted to understand what's going on, what is possibly the solution for this, what is the possible damage or the, or the pathology, then that is it. We're done with the summary. Now let's look at the details. So for the details, the first thing is the, our body's immune response. And we have been doing this discussion for a long time. Here is an antigen presenting cell. This could be a macrophage or a natural killer cells, sorry, dendritic cell. E cells are also antigen presenting cells, but they do not present it to the other cells. They, they work mostly for themselves. Anyway, so here, let's say this is a macrophage or a dendritic cell. This cell has picked up SARS-CoV-2, broken it up into smaller pieces, and then it presents that antigen on MHC2 to a naive T cell. Naive T cell binds with this antigen through the T cell receptor. In addition to that, there needs to be co-stimulation. We've done this discussion. There needs to be some hugs and kisses further to double check and triple check that the T cell need to be activated. Otherwise, the immune system would just start attacking everything and cause a problem. So there is CD28 and B7 interaction. And then there are some chemical substance interactions as well. For example, interleukin-12 may be needed or interleukin-4 will be needed. Now, here is a delicate point. If this T cell, while it is interacting with the antigen presenting cell, if it has interleukin-4 available and absence of interleukin-12, then this T cell will get converted into T helper 2. On the other hand, if it has chemical substances interleukin-12 available, which is usually released by the antigen presenting cell, then this T cell will become T helper 1. And that is the pathway that the researchers are saying is possibly taken. Why? Because the T helper 1 pathway activation causes interferon gamma production, not the T helper 2 pathway. So for this hypothesis to be active and or to be valid, we have to see those cases which are going to helper one pathway. So they are saying that this T helper one pathway movement towards that is possibly because of a skewing of the T cell receptor. And let's continue our discussion and it will become a little more clear. Now the same thing that I just said here, this is an antigen presenting cell, macrophage or a dendritic cell. This is a T helper naive cell or zero. They are binding here and there is CD B7 and CD28 and other things as we saw. However, if there is interleukin 4 and no interleukin 12, then this T helper naive cell will become T helper 2 and that pathway would go towards the antibody production. On the other hand, if naive T cell has interleukin 12 present and no interleukin 4, then the naive T cell gets converted into T helper 1. T helper 1 in turn releases what? Interferon gamma. This interferon gamma release is a normal process of T helper 1 pathway because interferon gamma is going to cause innate arm activation. This is what we say interleukin 12 interferon gamma axis that the innate arm releases interleukin-12 and in response, the acquired arm releases interferon gamma and they both amplify each other, right? So interferon gamma is produced by T helper 1s and many other cells. T helper 1 will then pause, if I can have my mouse work. T helper 1 will then cause these CD8 cells to become activated or cytotoxic T cells to become activated. Now, before 
I discuss more about this situation, I want to add one more thought in your mind, and that is 18% of the cases, UK cases of children with hepatitis, had SARS-CoV-2. 11% of the cases, apologies for this, 11% of the cases from England had SARS-CoV-2 or had recently had SARS-CoV-2. In Israel, out of 12, 11 patients, not percent, 11 patients had SARS-CoV-2 recently. And the researchers say that if we continue to do more testing on the serology of these children, we would actually see that more and more children had, we would find out more children that they have SARS-CoV-2. Now, here is the important thing. When the spike protein is present, what spike protein does is it causes the antigen-presenting cell and the T-cell interaction to be supercharged by binding to a superantigen binding site. Normally, superantigens do not even need to function. They do not even need this internal antigen. They can just bind outside and cause intense activation of the T-cells. They don't need much co-stimulations. They just come in. This is like someone who holds two cells' hands and tells them both to become active right now. So that is the super antigen sitting outside and binding them. Aflococcus enterotoxin B does that too and causes severe infection in the GIT. And do you know that the spike protein super antigen binding site actually resembles Staphylococcal enterotoxin B superantigen site. So now we have all the ingredients. We have reservoir, we have spike protein, we have immune system that can become overly activated by this spike protein acting as a superantigen. The end result is this pathway is taken, T helper 1 pathway. And when the T helper 1 pathway is taken, a lot of interferon gamma is produced. This interferon gamma has shown in the studies that if there is SARS-CoV-2 present and the interferon gamma is produced, then there is a lot of cytokine or intense response. Then the same study with in vitro hepatocytes present, in vitro, that is in the, in the lab in a little petri dish, if you put the hepatocytes there and you put interferon gamma on them, interferon gamma triggers apoptosis of the cell. It tells the cells to kill themselves. And that would, of course, cause liver damage. So that is the discussion. Once again, I'll go back to what is the takeaway? What do we do then? Number one, if a child is going through the jaundice and severe case, please take them to the hospital, number one. Number two, in the hospital, it will be interesting, important, I think, to have SARS-CoV-2 stool sample or stool sample for SARS-CoV-2, interferon gamma levels, and possibly T-cell reactivity. And then the outcome is going to be immunomodulators. So if they are already going to start doing the immunomodulators, it will be interesting to rule this in or out. So this is the discussion. Let me just very quickly now go over this report as well. So here they're talking about no hepatitis A, B, C, D, or E. 72% of the patients in the severe acute hepatitis in the UK were tested for adenovirus, had this 4-1-F1 or 2. And then they say, this is not an uncommon subtype and it is predominantly affects young children and immunocompromised patients. However, to our knowledge, adenovirus 41-F has not previously been reported to cause severe acute hepatitis. So it is not a severe acute hepatitis causing virus. And then they talk about some stats that I discussed them as well. Then SARS-CoV-2 infection can result in viral reservoir formation. They have a study here. That study is this study. And then they talk about the SARS-CoV-2 resembling the staphylococcal protein and triggering the immune system. Here they say, we hypothesize that the recently reported cases of severe acute hepatitis in children could be a consequence of adenovirus infection with intestinal trophism in children previously infected with SARS-CoV-2 and carrying viral reservoir. And then finally, they say, if 
this is the case, then please do this. Translated to the current situation, we suggest that children with acute hepatitis be investigated for SARS-CoV-2, persistence in stool, T-cell receptor skewing, and interferon gamma upregulation. And if evidence of superantigen-mediated immune activation is found, then immunomodulatory therapies are needed. So this is one. One more interesting uh, study that is kind of related to this, and that is this one. This is also a more recent study. This is May 14. The other study was also, I think, May 14, May 14. So very similar days. So this study, in here what they are doing is, this is a preprint. In this study, what they're talking about is that they looked at the data. It's a retrospective study. They looked at the data of the people who may have had uh, hepatitis. And they, in this study, we tested whether there were increased risk of elevated serum liver enzymes and bilirubin following COVID-19 in children. And they actually had a decent size. The study population comprised 796,369 children between the age of 1 and 10, including 245,675 who had contracted COVID-19 during March 11, 2020 to March 11, 2022 two years, and 550,694 who contracted non-COVID other respiratory infections. What is their takeaway? Their takeaway is that if a child has a COVID respiratory infection, then they have a likelihood of significantly increased liver enzymes compared to those children who didn't have the respiratory infection because of SARS-CoV-2, but they had other respiratory infections. Those children didn't have the liver enzymes increased. That's the, that's the important thing here, that SARS-CoV-2 itself has a tendency to cause stress on the liver. Then we also know that the children with the acute inflammation because of SARS-CoV-2 can have, have liver involvement too. And at the basis of all of this, it is possible that the pathology is because of the spike protein causing acting as a super antigen. So that is the discussion. Um, I hope I'll keep repeating it because I think the, the service part of this all is, please have these tests done. SARS-CoV-2 stool test, interferon gamma level, and T-cell. I think T-cell skewing may not be easy for all labs, but at least the two stool tests for SARS-CoV-2 and gamma interferon gamma levels are easy to do. These should be done and the uh, patient managers, the, the doctors, should be ready to use immunomodulation as early as possible. That is a discussion. Thank you very much. Please do me a favor, like, subscribe, and share. These kind of videos, even if you said, I don't want to like it or don't want to subscribe to it, at least share it. Maybe it would help someone. Maybe even some doctor who might actually not have read those studies yet and these studies might start a thought in their mind that may have them help some children. That is one. Secondly, if you would like to have more of these kind of lectures, then consider using Dr. Bean. If you look at the, uh, the link in the description, it's really inexpensive. It's really affordable. And, to, and it is a one-time payment. And you get access to about a thousand lectures. So that is the discussion. I would see you this evening as well. I wanted to make sure that I have taken care of this one. I'm looking at the questions. Okay, so I'm going to hang up. If you want to continue with the questions about this lecture, just tell me and I would come back live in next five minutes and we will only talk about questions related to this topic. That would allow this topic to stay short and we can have the question separately. Just um, when I hang up, I can still see your messages. So if you want it, please put your messages out there. Otherwise, I'll see you this evening at six.